Good morning, Southside. I'd like to welcome any visitors. We're grateful to have you visiting with us and hope you'll enjoy just the worship service of our God, forgetting ourselves and just worshiping God for all that He is in Christ Jesus. Um, I wanted to remind you one more time of this Bible study that we're starting up just to focus on marriage. It's a community group. We'll do that for a season, and then after that, we'll move into parenting. It's going to be at Nate and Tiffany Matthews' house. If you could reach out to her if you're coming, she would like to know that for numbers. Um, There'll be babysitting up to age five, I believe it is. Uh, It starts at 5.30, and the study will start officially at six o'clock, and, and it's being opened up to really anyone that wants to come work on their marriage. We were kind of going to focus maybe on engaged young marrieds, but uh, it seems like there's a greater need beyond that. So if you are interested in locking shields in a community group to just focus on uh, your marriage and glorifying God with it, uh, we would encourage you to come be a part of that. I wanted to remind you, we had a, a new family that moved out here from uh, Kansas City, Uh, and Carol Williams became sick, and he really didn't get uh, time to become a member here at Southside, but he has touched many lives, and he went to be with the Lord, and so I want you to pray for his wife, Sherry, who's going to be joining us here at Southside, and we get the privilege to help this widow journey in her faith in this season, and then his granddaughter, Megan, who's been coming here for years, uh, he really was her, her daddy, and so she needs our love and, and help as she journeys this during our season. So uh, the service will be this Friday if you would be praying for that. Um, oh, Pastor Rutland, is this your last Sunday? Is he over there? I thought I saw him earlier. Oh, there he is. Is this your last Sunday? Okay, I just wanted to let you know that Pastor Rutland is going to be going on a sabbatical Uh, and why he's off for three months, uh, just to be praying for him and and for the youth and all that will be going on there. Um, Just grateful for him. I'll never forget 20, probably 27 years ago, he showed up. I was a youth pastor at the Master's Bible Church, and he showed up and visited, and we started fellowshipping, and it was so deep and rich and sweet. And I said, I think we should plant a church one day together and just kind of mouthing off. Uh, And then the Lord just kept journeying, and he led us together to come plant Southside Bible Church. And I just can't thank the Lord enough for who he is in Christ and Heather and just all that they've meant to this body. So let's all just really be praying and bathing him in prayer and just helping him uh, refresh during this time. So love that brother with all my heart. Well, if you'll turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, we've been journeying this chapter together for over a month. Let's begin in verse 9, Philippians 2, 9. Christ humbled himself, he emptied himself, it was in the form of God, and he went to the point of humiliation, to the point of death, even death on a cross. And for that reason, God highly exalted him, and he bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is kurios, he's the Lord, and that will be to the glory of God the Father. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who has at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in this world, holding fast the word of life so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain or toil in vain. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and the service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Let's go to our God. 
Father, I thank you for this section of Scripture. I thank you um, that it is inspired by your Holy Spirit. I thank you we behold the truth, and the things that we are seeing are altogether lovely. Thank you for teaching us the, gl the glory and beauty of Christ and the humility that comes from those who are joined to him and have faith in him and know him. God, make us humble servants of our God. Lord, do a mighty work in our midst this morning. I feel like there's cancer that you need to cut out of each and every heart. There are things that are causing us not to be these bright lights that Paul is talking about in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. And so I pray that you would do surgery on each heart specifically this morning, and that God, that you would bring healing to it, that it, we wouldn't lay here and just bleed, but that you would heal us sweetly in Christ, and you would conform us more to his image as a result of this worship service. God, who could be more like Christ than the one who does not grumble or dispute? Lord, would you do this work in your people for your glory this morning? Amen. Well, we're diving into it this morning. The Holy Spirit has worked deep in my own heart as I've studied this passage, and it, it is a powerful passage, and it can be painful as well. So I'm asking Him to do a mighty work in our hearts this morning through the preached Word of God. So as we begin, I just want to set our context again briefly. Paul is concerned with how we live in light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.27, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the Son of God who came in this world to save sinners among who I am foremost. Paul wants us then, as recipients of this gospel, to stand firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of this gospel. He wants us united in that. And as we do that, don't be alarmed by your opponents who hate this gospel and therefore hate you. He says, go suffer for this gospel for his name's sake. Jesus died in your place, and now we go forth in this gospel, and we will suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. Philippians 2.1, as you enjoy the blessings of knowing Christ since you've tasted of his fellowship and encouragement and all that has come to you in this gospel, make my joy complete by gospel unity. You have such a blessing. You have such joy in Christ. Have unity in it. And then he moves to that there's cancer that can hurt this unity that we have as the people of God. And he said that, that cancer is pride. Pride is going to do great harm and damage to the body of Christ as you look out only for your interests and you look out for your self-glory. <laughs> You'll never get unity in that. You'll, that'll never bring unity. That will bring disunity to the body of Christ and to our homes and our lives. And then Paul is going to pull out and help us in this and give us the sweetest encouragement that there is. And it's going to be Christ in verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Have this attitude, people of God, in yourself, of the one who existed in the form of God, and he didn't regard equality with God a thing to be held on to, to be grasped, but he emptied himself by becoming obedient, obedient to the, to the point of death to come and bring about our salvation. And because of that, God has lifted him up above every name and given him the name Kurios. And Paul last week told us there's a response to such a gospel, that you're to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And we saw that there was a therefore tying it back to the gospel of what Christ has done, and that, that when Christ humbles us and we humble ourselves, that he, will, he, will, he knows how to exalt those and lift us up on that last day. And so this is a journey to glory, and we called it the path of humiliation. And so work it out, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. So as we begin to, to look at putting this sin to death that is in us from being an Adam, God has given us his Holy Spirit, and this Holy Spirit is giving us desires 
for holiness, and he's giving us his power to put to death the deeds of the flesh in our bodies. And so praise God that he doesn't just leave us to ourselves. He joins us to Jesus and gives us him, and he gives us a gospel that forgives us and makes us stand in his presence, blameless with great joy, loved infinitely. In eternity past to eternity future, this gospel has given you everything in Christ Jesus. And so therefore, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And so the goal of all of this is that the gospel will go forth. And he said in verse 11, when this happens, it will be to the glory of God the Father. And we saw in verse 3 that our, our, our struggle is this self-glory, that what gets in the way and brings disunity is I want glory for myself. I want to be made much of. I want to be weighty. I want people to care about me. I come into the world thinking I'm God and everyone should exist for me. And this gospel of Jesus Christ, when you see what he did, it breaks that. And it changes our hearts to where now it's the glory of God that makes me breathe, live, and exist. I want the glory of God. It's the only thing that can break self-glory. You will spend your life on you all of your days unless the supernatural power of God shows you the gospel of Jesus Christ and you die. And what comes to life is I want to spend the rest of my days magnifying this God, not me. There's something so much better than me. I'm so glad that life isn't about me. It would destroy you. It's about this God who will heal you and transform you and change you. He's the center of everything. So now this morning, Paul's going to show the attitude of our hearts that must be present as we work this out. And in showing this, <coughs> he's going to show us another cancer that will, that will destroy and disease the body of Christ. And it's really, I think it's a specific application of verses 3 and 4 do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. And so the root of this sin is pride and self-glory as well. I think much of myself, I, I just can't get over me. And so this section, it, it's just strung together masterfully. I mean, it's just the mind of God overwhelms me when I get into it. So listen, do all things in verse 14 without grumbling or disputing. And what I want you to see, there's no therefore and there's no for. It's just the flow of thought from last week. We broke last week, but Paul didn't. <laughs> Paul wasn't finished. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And there's one way that you're going to work that out. And Paul's going to say, don't grumble or dispute. That's going to kill your unity. It's a gangrene in the church of Christ. It's so ugly, Paul says, it's going to darken your testimony to the world. Grumblers, you're not going to have someone come up and say, what's the hope within you? Paul says, I don't want to have run in vain over you. That's how much he ties this grumbling and disputing into the, the labor that he's doing. He says, I'm going to be martyred as I labor for your faith, Philippians. I'm laboring for you to not be grumblers. This is, this is big stuff that Paul's addressing this morning. I can't think of a time when it's been more of an issue than it is right now in our current day and season. The, the toxic election that's coming our way is highlighting much to grumble and dispute about, and it's just gearing up, and it's ramping, and it's just, it's the air we breathe. And I just want you to pause for a moment this morning, and don't let this get by you. This is to be put off from the believer in Christ. It's to be mortified. It's to be put to death. This is not to be what we are characterized by as the people of God. This will destroy our testimony to the world from within our hearts and, and into our church. And get your hearts ready for the Word of God this morning. James says, um, receive the word in humility. And there's this Greek word that says, get the wax out of your ears. I want you to hear the word of God this morning and I want you to prepare your heart for what we're about to look at. Because I do believe this is the air that we breathe. And it's truly, as we've looked at that book um, by Bridges, it's an acceptable sin. I think it's so prevalent 
that it doesn't bother us anymore. It doesn't, it doesn't even feel like a sin any longer in the house of God. And, and I'll tell you right now, as we can dress grumbling up in pretty ways, we can call it prayer requests. We can call it concern. We can call it, I'm just venting. That's like sacred. I'm just keeping it real, baby. I'm transparent. What else would we talk about? How about Philippians 1 and the gospel of Jesus Christ? Before we begin, I just felt like you guys needed some anesthesia before I begin. So before the scalpel goes in, because I wanted to cut off flesh that has overgrown my heart and your heart. This is to save your life and your testimony of Jesus Christ to this world. And so I want to start with verse 8 of Philippians 2, that Jesus became obedient to the point of death on a cross, that my hope is the one who came in this world and he obeyed God in every way and there was never one grumbling word from the mouth of Christ. My only hope to stand before God is this, the tongue of Jesus Christ. So I just want to begin with your hope is in the righteousness of Jesus Christ and that he has died for every grumbling tongue in this building and has washed that sin away as far as the east is from the west. I just want to start with the gospel as we begin surgery. Jesus Christ is my hope of glory. And so I wanted you to know, as we open this up and expose it in your heart, there's a sweet remedy for this sin this morning. As Paul opens it up, he's going to give more remedies than even the sin. And so at the end, I'll close it back up, and I'll give you some pain meds at the end of your surgery with the gospel again. And I'll give you some ice cream, some food, and those cute little socks that you get at the hospital. My, my son had a hernia surgery when he was two or three, and he got these little yellow socks with rubber things on, on the bottom and his grandma, who's probably here today, the sweetest, oh, there she is. Um, she, every time she went in the hospital, from, now, from then till now, she brings him these little socks because she knows he loves them. So you probably have 27 pairs of those little yellow socks. Sorry for getting distracted. <clears throat> grumbling, grumbling. Why did Paul pick this sin? Why does this one hurt our testimony so bad? Why could this one make Paul think that he labored over the saints in Philippians in vain? It just feels big to me. And I'm a weird guy. I want to know why. I, when something like this jumps out, like this specific and this deep and this severe, why this one, Paul? There's got to be something major that we're unfolding this morning. And I get pride I understand why he started there and the humility of mind and the battle with vainglory. I get that. But isn't it just a little grumbling? It, it just feels small to me. And I'm afraid it's because it's so prevalent that it feels small to me when I was studying this week. And so let's see if we can get an answer to that question because the answer might heighten it in your hearts this morning and cause us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling and putting this to death to get it out of our lives and not just baby it and pamper it and kiss it. So this one statement goes right to the heart of our Christianity. The heart of this chapter is do nothing out of selfishness or empty conceit. Don't live for vain glory. Don't live for yours. And we saw that vainglory makes us think this is all about ourselves. This is about our value, how others treat us. Uh, do they treat me well enough? Do, do, do they treat me like I'm nothing or weightless? Those are the things that drive humans. And the fruit of this thinking will make us regard ourselves more than others. It will produce that, that I'm, I'm the most important thing to think about and everybody else should be the same way. I got to look out for my own personal interests, and it makes me selfish, and it turns me inward. And so we need help. We need, verse 5, we need, we need the mindset of Jesus. And verse 11, we need that we've been saved now for the glory of God the Father. And now we flush out more vain glory, that I'm the center of the universe, so I matter supremely. And so just catch this, God 
circumstances and people should work to serve me the way that I feel that I deserve or want. That's the fruit of vainglory. I, I, I should be treated better than this. God should treat me better than this. But what is the reality? Life will never do that. I don't care who you are. No one, and I mean no one, is ever going to think that you're as neat as you think you are. It just won't happen. I've never met anyone that thinks that way about me. That life to them is to make you the center of their lives. Some of you get married and you think your spouse is supposed to make you the center of life. That's killing marriages because it's God that's the center of a marriage. And so what will happen to this person who thinks this way is you're always going to be disappointed. You're always going to be discontent, disillusioned, depressed. The list will go on and on because people don't think of you the way you think they should. And how is that going to manifest itself? Grumbling and disputing. I do believe we're on the heart of Christianity this morning. If, if you'll just flip over where Paul's taking all of Philippians, will you go to Philippians 4.10? I want you to see, he begins it here, and he's going to move it to the remedy in verse 10. Paul says in Philippians 4.10, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, and now at last you've revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you just lacked the opportunity to help him. Not that I speak from want. This is an amazing statement. For I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. The perfect participle, it means that all of Paul's life has brought him to this place where he finally can be content and, and hear that in whatever circumstances I'm in. There's a way, Christians, to grow to a place that your circumstances will not dictate how you feel and, and whether you're content or not. There is a way to be content in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. And Paul says, I've learned that. I know how to get along with humble means. And I know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, Circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. How, how can anyone do that? Well, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That, that verse isn't just for when you score touchdowns. I can be content and whatever comes into my life, because it comes from God for my good and his glory, and I can do it through him who strengthens me, who's working out my salvation both to will and to do his good pleasure. Paul's moving this. This is where he wants us to go, brothers and sisters. And I want you to hear this. Grumbling is the opposite of faith and joy. It is the exact opposite. It's the fruit of vainglory. Grumbling will always come about because God should treat you better and others should. And why you're grumbling is because you are so important and you're just going to just be grumbling about everything and anything. So this is cured in the gospel of Jesus Christ alone. It's cured in Christ's glory. I look at Paul and he's sitting in prison and, and there's, they're saying, man, Paul, the, the gospel is, is not, you went there to preach it, and now you're put in prison. How are you? And he begins the letter, I thank my God. I, I rejoice in all things, because God is the one who's bringing them. And so I, I can be in prison, and I just trust him for what he's doing, and now the gospel's going all the way through the Roman guards because of my imprisonment. And he says, Paul, you, you, you can't preach. Others are preaching to put the screws in tighter in you. He says, I don't care. I, 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 whether I live or die, I just want the name of Christ preached. And if I get life instead of death, it will be for Christ. And if I die, it will be gain because I will get more of Jesus Christ. I want you to hear this. You can't get grumbling out of Paul and what he's wrestling with is prison, getting his head cut off or not. And he's sitting in those circumstances just singing and worshiping because of his view of Christ. I, I just want him exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. There's a way to get into this place and it's only gonna come by a passion and a love for the glory of Jesus 
Christ, that can eclipse vainglory. Please see what grumbling is this morning. Take its dress off. We call it anger. We call it pouting, escaping, judgmental, focusing on other sins, lying, withdrawing. There are so many expressions to this. But what I want you to hear is it, it's, it's atheism. It's atheism. It's looking at life without God. And it's looking at Romans 8.28 that we know, we know experientially that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. The gospel, God is good. He's great. He's glorious and he's gracious. I believe that. My life is now his will. And from these new eyes that can see God, it can bring contentment. And it can replace grumbling with trust and praise, and prayer, and I'm watching it come out of your hearts like crazy. I'm watching you lose loved ones and, and praise God. I'm watching someone in a hospital waiting to find out if they got cancer or not give praise and worship to God. I've never seen anything like this. The power of God to begin to enter in, I trust him. I think the essence of Christianity, I trust this God who is now my Father, to work everything in my life for good. Grumbling, hear it, it's shaking your fist at God. You're telling him he's not enough. You're not enough. What he has done for you is not enough. What he has promised to do in the future is not enough. And basically, he's getting your life wrong. He's, he's missing it. He's blowing it. And I want you to hear this. This is for free. Most grumblers go after secondary means of what's going on in their lives, but it's God who you're grumbling against. Just stare that in the face. Every grumble, every complaint. No, I'm just complaining about Taylor right here. No, I'm complaining about God who's working through secondary means in my life. You get caught up in secondary means and you'll spend your whole life frustrated, irritated, and grumbling. But when you see this sovereign God who's gonna bring every person, every difficult situation into your life to conform you into the image of Jesus Christ, praise can rise in everything that he brings into your life. Life, nothing is not from the hand of God. That's a bad way of saying it. Everything is from the hand of God. And so I'm just gonna ask you, has the gospel brought you into this sweet place? Has it brought you under God with now a will that comes under his? It says, thy will be done. In our little prayer meeting, I think I hear it 18 times every Sunday, thy will be done. Thy will be done. That's what the gospel does. If you're not content this very second in the Lord and in his will, you will not be content if your circumstances change. But you will grumble. You'll spend your life grumbling. Kenny Rogers wrote a song, I Met Up With The Grumbler. Um, you'll be the grumbler. That's what you'll be known for. And I just want to shoot as straight with you as I know how, because I love you. Since COVID, what has exploded in this world, and even in this church, as grumbling went to another degree? I've watched it just ratchet itself up. It's the culture that we live in. And Paul said, don't be conformed to this world. Don't take on the world's thinking and the way it acts. And the world is grumbling like I've never seen. And we're, we're drawing from it, and we're gaining its thoughts and we're starting to be grumblers, and we're beginning to grumble about this and that and this and that. Um, we grumble about God. We grumble about his providences. We grumble about our nation. We grumble about our president. We grumble about our pastors. We grumble about our spouses, our bodies, our churches, our family, our money, our inflation, our food, our service. We, we grumble about the weather. I, I, every winter, it's like, this is the worst stuff in the world. I hate it. And then summer is like, it's so hot. I hate it. Which is it? We grumble about our friends, our children, our music, our preaching, 
The temperature in the building, our rights, our practices at the church. We grumble, grumble, grumble. We spend all day grumbling when we have been given every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We have a Christ who didn't consider equality with God a thing to be grasped and emptied himself. I have everything in Christ. That's the life of faith. Every spiritual blessing has been given to you in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Grumblers are, I have nothing, I don't have this, I don't have that, I need this, I need that. You will grumble your eyes out without the life of faith. Nothing will go right. This, we already said this is the life of humiliation. If you think this is Fantasy Island or heaven, I got bad news, it isn't. He says, you're going to suffer. I consider my present sufferings in this wor world not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed in me. He promises that. And in our next verse... You want to be a light? Do you want to be a light in this world? Do all things without grumbling. You want to be set apart and be different? Grumbling. Go ask your friends. I hate to say this. Every once in a while, some of your reputations, you're a grumbler. Do you want to be known for that? How you doing? I don't want to be known for that. That's not a light. That's not, look at that guy's God. How great is that? I shouldn't try to sing. That's horrible. <laughs> Sorry. Jordan got me fired up last night. You want to be a light, then this is it. And I had about five pages of notes how to drive home how deep this is in our hearts. And as I've been praying this week, I realized when Nathan said, you're the man, I believe that probably all of you are there. Is there anyone that doesn't think they're a grumbler? I'll keep going. Perfect. It's ugly to our God. Well, how do you know? Well, it's nothing new. Adam said to God, the, the problem is the woman that you gave me. And before he was worshiping, going, she's now bone of bone and flesh of my flesh. It's like you guys on your altar. She's the best ever. And a week later, I can't believe you gave me this Jezebel and you're complaining and you're grumbling. And here's Adam doing the same thing. It's the woman you gave me, God. Cain in Genesis 4.13, he said, Lord, my punishment is too great to bear. Moses in Exodus 5.22, Moses returned to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, why hast thou brought harm to this people, Israel? Why did you send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he's done harm to this people, excuse me, and thou has not delivered thy people at all. He's grumbling. Aaron and Miriam, they speak against Moses complaining, and Miriam is made leprous. Jonah's complaining that he knows if he goes to Nineveh, God's so gracious he's going to save them if they repent. The Old Testament is just jam full of people complaining against the providences of God and this God who's like a mother to them and a father and he's nurturing and he's bringing them out of slavery. And the whole book is grumbling, grumbling, grumbling. Uh, we saw it in Romans 9.20. On the contrary, Paul says, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Jude 1.16, listen to this. These are grumblers. Finding fault, following after their own lusts, they speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. Israel is probably our best example. God heard their cries and he led them out of slavery with 10 mighty plagues and the Egyptian army is now chasing them. And in Exodus 14, 11, they said to Moses, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? After the Red Sea, they sing the song of deliverance and they worship their God. The very next chapter, we have no meat, we're grumbling because we don't have it. So God gives them quail and they'll grumble about the quail. Exodus 17, no water. They grumble and they quarrel and water comes from a rock. And so it's just Numbers 11, 1. The people became like those who complain of adversity in the hearing of the Lord. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. 
Numbers 13, they spy out the land and their giants in the land and they all start to grumble and complain and it spreads like gangrene through the whole nation. <clears throat> Numbers 14, 27, how long, God says, shall I bear with this evil congregation who are grumbling against me? I've heard the complaints of the sons of Israel which they're making against me. Say to them as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will surely do to you. Your corpses shall fall in the wilderness, even all your numbered men, according to your complete number from 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me. We wouldn't even be here if God still did that to us. Surely you shall not come into the land in which I swore to give you except Caleb and Joshua. I think of Korah's rebellion when they rise up against Moses and say, who are you to lead us? We're all holy. And in Numbers 16, 41, on the next day, all the congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, saying, you're the ones who have caused the death of the Lord's people because the ground opened up and swallowed them whole. 1 Corinthians 10, 8, don't let us act immorally as some of them did in the, in the wilderness. 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come to not be the grumblers. And so as we look at it, we see this typology that we were in spiritual bondage and we've been delivered by God by his outstretched hand, the son of God. And his providential love and care is deeply upon us. And he's given us everything for life and godliness. And he gave us his only begotten son. And he says, surely will I not give you all things. And so to live an eye toward all that God has done is the life of faith. The opposite of Christianity is to live with an eye of all that God has not done. Absolute contentment, as he tells us, is what he will do for us as well. And so we are just encompassed in what God has done, what he's doing, and what he will do for us. And we gather as the people of God to worship this God. We have everything in him. And grumbling is that, God, you're not good and great and glorious and gracious. Just a quick lexical study. The word grumbling, gagusmon, it's, the word means murmur, gagusmon, gagusmon, gagusmon. It's just, you just murmur, murmur, murmur. It's an expression of discontentment and grumbling. It's a complaint expressed in a negative attitude. It's a rejection of your circumstances, this grumbling. And disputing is a little more interesting. It's, it referred to the thought process or the reasoning. In the negative sense, it meant to dispute and to have arguments. And so these are the thoughts of uh, you can dispute with God or others. And you dispute with God. Why are you doing this? Why is my life going this way? Why am I suffering? Why is the world this way? And you're arguing and disputing with him. But you can also do it against other people. These people should not think this way, treat me this way, or act this way. It can lead to arguments because you're so big and God is so little. And you're just always in disputes and arguments and grumbling. And I, I've watched, this, this can happen over doctrine and theology about our God. You begin disputing and fighting and arguing with differences that aren't essential. 2 Timothy 2.8, therefore I want men in every place lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension, without this quarreling and grumbling and fighting. Luke 9.46, an argument arose among the apostles, and here's a great reason to argue, as to which of them might be the greatest. <laughs> Every time Jesus predicted his crucifixion, they argued about who was the greatest. Go read it. It's, a, it's an interesting argument. But Jesus, knowing what they were thinking in their heart, took a child, and he brings him by his side and tells you, unless you become like these little ones, you won't enter the kingdom of God. So scripture is loaded with warnings for those who cause divisions, word wranglers, dissensions, running around getting in disputes and arguments, all pawned off as being faithful. God hates that spirit within his body. These things smear the testimony of our church within and without. Grumbling. 
grumbling about your church, the people in your church, your families, the government. Grumbling is one of the most contagious things there is. It's way more contagious than COVID four years ago. I know a lot of you debate how contagious it was. Let's argue about it, huh? No, just kidding. <laughs> I'm shocked how many think it's okay if it's with a spouse or a like-minded friend to grumble. More grumbling will take place in a bedroom than anywhere else. So my question this morning, how do I overcome this? I don't want to live like an atheist. I want to learn what Paul learned, how to be content in all my circumstances. And so it begins with Jesus, have the mindset that he had of humiliation and to come under and quit thinking about yourself all the time. How do I think about others and how do I come and wash feet? Others are more important than me. Have the mindset of your king. And then look at the gospel. When you see what Jesus did, Self-glory dies. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. That life of self-glory dies. And in this gospel, the glory of God becomes your chief end. And this is the place where contentment can come, is it's not my perfect life. It's whatever God brings into my life. I just want to bring glory to him and make him look great to anyone and everyone. That, that's, that's when this gets real, when I get there. And then don't miss Philippians 2.13. This is the best news ever. For it's God who's at work in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. I've tried for decades to put to death grumbling. And you know what happened? I grumbled more. I'm like, wait a minute, I'm trying so hard. I'm, I'm going under my own strength, the law. I'm going to quit grumbling. And, and the more I tried, I just noticed it would get worse. And so... Thank God, that's what he said would happen. And I want you to hear this morning, you have the Holy Spirit revealing Jesus to you and all the promises of God are yea and amen in him to make you be, have power from on high through him to put this to death. And I've learned it so simple. You know when I grumble? When Jesus is, feels distant to me. When, I have, when I'm not in the secret place the way I should. So when I drift from Jesus, I just feel negative, critical, and grumbling. And when I'm in the secret place, walking with Jesus, drinking from him, you know what I feel? Praise, thanks. I give all of you just so much grace. I just think the best. I hope and believe in you. And get away from Jesus, and that's what will happen. And I just want you to hear this morning. You have the Holy Spirit of God to put Jesus, to reveal him into your hearts so that you are so content, and you don't feel so bitter and nasty on the inside, and you don't have to grumble about everyone and every circumstance, and you can just be content by the grace of Almighty God. Work it out. Work it out. That's your command through the power of God. And so my call this morning is, can we be a church? Can we be a team unified in Christ to pray and help each other work out our salvation with our hearts and our tongues and to help each other with your grumbling? I want, you, I want you to love me enough to say, Pastor Ken, you're grumbling a little more than normal. Remind me. Remind each other. Help each other. Let's be a team. Come together as one to, to work out our salvation together. Ask a spouse. They're good at telling you the truth. And put your seatbelt on. Ask your children. They, they don't like to hold back either. Ask your best friend. Too many of them hold back. Be a best friend. Just say, will you be honest with me? Am I characterized by the spirit of grumbling? Get with someone who knows you because you're going your, to let yourself up. And just see if it's there, how deep. And let's go to Christ and live into the gospel. When I'm under grace, which is since I've been saved, man, we can put this to death through his power and the joy of the gospel and what he has given us. Am I a spiritual Eeyore? I think I've told you before, but I had this little girl in my youth group 
maybe 30 years ago, and every time I'd say, how you doing? It was always like, eh, meh, 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 just 20 negative things. And I said, okay, hon, I, I want to try something. I want you to tell me one positive thing before you tell me 20 negative things. And we just started working on it, and it, it, she grew in it. But is that you? How you doing? And what oozes out is everything that God hasn't given you and your circumstances. I just, you, there, there's people sitting in this room that you are so content in Christ. And what always comes out of you is him, what he's doing, how sweet he is, how beautiful. There, there's a place that you can enter in by faith where God can begin to do this in your hearts. Do all things without grumbling and disputing. And I had fewer notes, and I'm going longer, so I better get moving. You ready for some application? No, you're not. No, you're not. Do you remember when I put up those charts a while ago from the CTO material? And it showed that we all have our goals. Every one of us got goals of what it is I want to accomplish, what I want to do, how I think people should treat me. And we spend our whole lives with these goals. And when we don't reach them, we, we end up in disappointment. It can grow to anger. It can grow to grumbling. It can cause so many things because we have our goals. And, and we got to realign our goals as Christians. And our goals now are to glorify God. That's his goal for you, to glorify him with your life to know him intimately, and to serve an eternal purpose for your God. you got to change your goals to God's or you will be frustrated your whole life because your goals, you'll never get to them. And you'll be angry, a controller, manipulator. You're, you're just always going to be disappointed because your goals aren't being reached. And if you can shift your goals to God's goals, you can become content in whatever he brings into your life. So that is what God is doing. Our goals come under his. Are you, are you using, this is a clear question, are you using God for your goals? You know how much Christianity in America is that? We come to Christ to use God now for him to give us our goals, health, wealth, and prosperity. And, and it's not just there. It sits here in our own hearts. We are trying to manipulate God. If I do enough good things, he'll give me this. And, and we are using God to give us our goals instead of dying to our goals, to live, to make our goals his. There's a big difference, and I, I'm, I could change your life if you understood what I just said and believed it. When you, when you are living for your goals, you'll be a grumbler. And when you live for God's, you can become content. I got the blessing of meeting with Austin and Claire Elise this week, and Many of you know she's been battling lymphoma as she delivered her second baby and the other one was a toddler. Um, as we sat on their porch, what was emanating from their hearts this day was just contentment and praise and how good God has been and looking through the, all this trial and there was just worship coming from that porch and I'm sitting there going, how does this come out? delighting in Jesus Christ and the gospel and trusting God that he's working the things that they can't understand or figure out. There's a trust in their God. And so I just want you to see there is a way by his power to enter into this. He can cause me to will and to do his good pleasure. Second, and I, before I move on, they've had their seasons of darkness and doubt and despair. So I want you to know it's, there, there, there's a battle of a fight of faith. This isn't perfect and easy, but this is the answer that we're all trying to work out to grow into. Second, are you living worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ by living into this unity of the Spirit? Are, could you sit here today just saying, I am in the unity of the Spirit of the body of Christ at Southside Bible Church? Or are you a note that's off key? That, that, that beautiful singing this morning almost brought me to tears because I don't have the greatest ear, but it sounded perfect to me. Like they were spot on. I want the whole church to be just like that in, in the unity of the Spirit. We hurt the name of Christ and his glory uh, by this spirit of pride and grumbling. Call it what you want. It's your glory alone that you're after if that's what you're doing. Stare into the gospel of Jesus Christ 
and let these cancers be driven out of your heart by the beauty and glory of Jesus Christ this morning. So just check your heart. Am I breaking the unity of the Spirit with all my grumbling and disputing and self-glory and everybody's not loving me enough? And are you breaking it? Because it matters to God. And I just want you to at least take that in. Stare in the gospel again this morning and say, is that what it's producing in my heart? Because some of you are just, you're, you're, you're like the piano when it doesn't get tuned. You're, you're off. And I'm just begging you this morning to repent and, and turn from that and enter in with Christ and the body and the sweet unity of what we have in the gospel. All different walks of life, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. Boy, what we have in Christ. Next week, in verse 15, he's going he's gonna to say that we're, we're supposed to be lights in this world. And I was just sitting there running through my head, why didn't you pick one of the Ten Commandments? Why, why is grumbling going to make us be bright lights in this world? And it's pretty simple. It's the air we breathe. And everything about this world is grumbling and disputing because it's a fallen world. So they're gro we're groaning for redemption, and they're groaning to get more of the world and have it work out. And so this world will always live in discontentment and grumbling till, till they go home. And when you quit living like that, light. <laughs> Be content in all things. You make God look good. Like, what a God they serve. Anything that comes into their life, they, they praise, they worship, they don't curse their God. Look at these people. You know, you know anyone like this? I do. And they just give off the aroma of Jesus and they make my heart long to be like them. When Lord Peterborough lodged for a season with Fenelon, the Archbishop of Cambrai, he was so delighted with his piety and his virtue that he exclaimed when they parted, if I stayed here any longer, I should become a Christian in spite of myself. The, 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 the attitude and the heart of this person. If I spend another night there lodging with him, I'm going to become a Christian despite myself. <laughs> Andrew Bonar, his wife met Robert Murray McShane, and she said something singularly attractive about this man's holiness. It was not his matter nor his manner that struck me. It was just that he was a living epistle of Christ, a picture so lovely I felt that I would have given all the world to be as he was, but knew all the time that I was dead in my sins. That's a light. You live this way, and you're going to make God look great, and you're going to put him on display. And so let's work this out at Southside and stop grumbling and disputing. Husbands, love your wives. And the way Christ loved us is we had so many warts and sins and bad things. And it didn't turn him away from us, it turned him toward us. So I'm asking you husbands, lose your lives for your bride and never let sin turn you away from going after that sweet lady to conform and shape her into the image of Jesus Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands. Submission is not when we just both agree on something. So submission says it will bring the aroma and glory of Jesus Christ to this world when you see this relationship and this team working so beautifully. Children, honor your parents. You'll put him on display. Instead of husbands and wives and children grumbling singles, you have this season of a singular focus on Jesus Christ. This is your time. This is your time where you can just single focus on this sweet Christ. One thing I do. Older people, Nike. You want to know the most number one age that we grumble at? Older. I'm telling you, it's no joke. Thomas Brooks says the two rarest sights in the world are a humble young person. I'll say amen to that and a content old person because their lives didn't work out the way they wanted and what they thought and their bodies are giving out and they grumble and they whine and they complain, how you doing? It's my bunions, it's this, it's that. And all we do is grumble. 
And he says, you get a content old person who says, oh, God is conforming me to the image of Christ. I remember when Tim Keller said, I, if I could go back and have the energy I had at 20 years old, but I would give it up because I have the wisdom that I have in my 60s to understand God and know the Christian life. May we grow old people in contentment and show these young people how to trust God as our bodies give out and our lives didn't work out with the fantasy island that we thought when we first started. Can we show these young people what it looks like to hope and trust? And young people, get with the old people and ask them, how can they be content the way they are? Come together. And then Peter said, this is going to feel really out there, but it isn't. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. Just an application that's been sitting on my heart for a while. Uh, I, I had a brother just encourage me in this. Once a month, have one family over or one, with one single or two singles, just once a month to get someone into your home and love on them and build relationship without complaint. You know the number one place to complain and grumble? When someone comes to your house and just destroys it. <laughs> they come and they destroy everything. And, and you have a choice. What am I living for? And so I want to grow and just people in my home where I just want to love them and, and, and not complain. So hospitality without complaint. So we're going to close. Humility, we said, is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking less about yourself. We said humility is what you look at. Christ, not yourself. Paul said, look at Jesus. And so let's look at Jesus. In Isaiah 53, 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that was led to the slaughter and like a sheep, he was silent before its shears. So he did not open his mouth. He did not grumble. He did not complain. He just went to the cross with joy, with joy. And then in 1 Peter, he committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. While being reviled by others, he didn't revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but he kept entrusting himself to a God who judges righteously. Abide in him, Jesus. His spirit is working in you to become this kind of person by the gospel of grace and your acceptance and the love of God. And as you abide in that, work it out. Seek him. Seek grace to put to death this sin by the Holy Spirit, by the faith and promises. Starve grumbling because you have everything in Jesus Christ. And Paul said, I count all things lost compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. You want to quit grumbling when Jesus is everything? You take away anything and you can't grumble because I have everything. I have everything in Jesus Christ. That's how this is going to get driven out, by faith in this precious Lord. That's enough. Anyone grumbling how long it went? I'm going to bring that up every week. Father, I pray, conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. Let us have the mind of Christ. God, bring us into this humility. Let your glory alone be what drives our hearts and our lives. Let us understand that you are the sovereign one now who works all things together for our good. Help us to quit just grumbling, but to become this deep, contented Christian. And all that I have in Christ, all that I have in God, the Godhead, and all that you're bringing for our future. God, you've taken care of everything Please let us live into the fullness of it by faith and not spend all of our days living like the unbelievers. God, let us be bright lights where the whole world will look in and give glory to our God that they would ask, what's the hope within us? God, do this in Southside Bible Church. Lord, put an end this morning to grumbling. Put it to death by your spirit. Cause us to will and to do your good pleasure. Let us be diligent in the means of grace to want to see this sin removed so that there's contentment in Christ and there's just, we can't even get grumbling out of our mouths because our hearts are so full and a full Savior. God, we need help. 
Our flesh is just grumbling. It will grumble till we get redeemed. And so I pray, help us. We need your help. We need your grace. Let us live in the sweet gospel and let every child of God now look to Jesus who bled and died for every grumbling tongue that they have ever done or will do. Oh, Jesus, thank you for being guilty as a grumbler, dying on that cross for our sins. We give you praise and glory and honor. Thank you. Amen.